Come on, got there. Um, my big idea, cuts and straight to the chase, is that we now have all of the technologies, all of the sensors, all of the computing power, all of the infrastructure we need to build an external black box, like a data flight recorder for an aircraft, for every individual person. Uh, and it's based on recording what eventually becomes our memories. Our memory is essential for practically everything that we do. It's essential for coordination and movement. It's essential for every kind of planning that we execute, any kind of executive function that we perform, any thoughts or any processes of consciousness that we follow. And when it works, it's perfect. But it doesn't always work, of course, and would, would be in a worse place if it did work. A couple of weeks ago, I lost my glasses. Many people in the room have done likewise. And I couldn't find them. So my wife told me, well, retrace your steps. Where were you? What were you doing when you lost them? All of that kind of stuff. And I tried as well as I could to try and re retrace where I had left those, those, uh, those glasses. Or the worst example of when memory fails is when you can't think of somebody's name. Somebody comes up to you, or to me in my case, and says, hi, Alan, how are you? I haven't seen you in ages. How's work? How's this? How's that? And you're going complete blank. You can't remember their, their name. That happens to all of us. And it's a natural feature and an inbuilt characteristic of our memories. The kind of memory I'm interested in is autobiographical. It's personal, it's individual, it's tailored for each one of us. And that autobiographical memory works in three processes. In the first process, what we process, the first step of the process, what we do is we encode from our senses what we are hearing, what we see, what we smell, what we feel, what we touch. Right? And that leads to a, 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 a construction of a sense of what is going on for us. We then ingest that into our memories and we analyze it. We, we determine whether it's important, whether it's worth uh, remembering or not. And if it is important and worth remembering, then we store it in our long-term memory. Once it's stored in our long-term memory, we can then access it. We can dig in and we can retrieve information from that long-term memory. And that's functionally the way our memory works. Our memory has got two kinds of memory. Our brains have got two kinds of memory, rather. One is short-term memory. And there's a paper published about 50 years ago which which analyzed what our short-term memory is. And it says that we can recall seven things, plus or minus two, which means we can recall either five or nine things, over a period of about the last minute. So things like telephone numbers and people's names, they are stored in our short-term memory and they stay there for up to a minute. And if they're not important enough, they're discarded, like the location where I lost my glasses. Where I put them wasn't important enough and therefore it was discarded and therefore I couldn't remember where I'd left them. Our normal, healthy memory isn't perfect. And there's things that are characteristic of that, like the absent-mindedness we have when we lose our glasses. We also have another characteristic of our memory, which is that it, it degenerates over time. And you, you encounter this when you see somebody you haven't met for many years, perhaps somebody from, from school. And you see somebody and you go, oh, you know, Mark Dennis, how are you? I haven't seen you in ages. I haven't seen you in 20 or 30 years. How are you? And you start to talk about things that happened in the past. And you start to remember things that have long since been forgotten. School teachers, the nicknames that you gave them, the tricks that you played on them, all of that kind of stuff. All of that stuff is a natural phenomenon for memory that is the natural degeneration over time. And there's another characteristic of our memories, which are called Proustian moments, which are an, a spontaneous, uncontrollable cascade of memories of things from the past. So whenever I smell deep, rich, roasted coffee, I always remember, or it always reminds me, of Bewley's and Grafton Street. Or whenever I taste almond icing on a Christmas cake, it always reminds me of, as a child, baking Christmas cakes, and my mother making Christmas cakes, and me having to help with the icing. Memory, therefore, has a lot of really interesting characteristics, and therefore it is attractive for multiple disciplines. So neuroscientists are interested, and psychologists, psychiatrists, biologists, health professionals, cognitive scientists, but I am none of those. I'm a computer scientist. So what is a computer scientist doing with an interest in memory. I believe that we have the technologies which are now in place to encode what our senses pick up and sense about our environment. What we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we feel. All of those things can be encoded and captured digitally. Once they're captured digitally, they can then be stored. And storage of information on a global scale is not now a problem right, because of the technologies we have to store and then to access. The third part of the memory process, however, the retrieval, is for me the most challenging, and that's the area in which I work. We can manage these vast amounts of information, 
And therefore, we should be able to translate that and manage vast amounts of personalized information. When you put those three things together, the ability to sense, record, perhaps using devices as simple as wearable devices or our smartphones, when we put together the technology to store and then to access that, we have, I believe, the capacity to do, to build a human black box, an external memory for each one of us. What would you do with such an external memory? What would you be using, what would you use it for? Well, I'm not sure, right? And I regard this as an, as an enabling technology which opens up opportunities for applications which haven't been invented yet. There are some low-hanging fruits, however, which we can use, and we have been able to do this. Um, so when memory is broken, when memory is broken as a result of acquired brain injury or early-stage dementia or Alzheimer's or dementia or other forms of, of memory impairment, then what we've been able to do is use simple sensors like wearable cameras to help people who have broken memories, broken short-term memories, to achieve short-term memory recall. But I believe we're in a place now where we're using this technology, we can be much more ambitious than just supporting short-term memory recall for people who have various forms of Alzheimer's or brain, uh, acquired brain injury. Meanwhile, the glasses, I couldn't find them, so I had to go to Specsavers. Thank you.